so happy to have everyone here for our last um, New Voices in Global Security seminar of the academic year. Um, and we're definitely ending on a high. I'm super excited for this presentation. So we'll just give another minute or so, or rather 30 seconds or so for people to sign in and then we'll get started. Okay, I think we'll, yeah, I think we'll get started now. Okay, so welcome um, to, again, the, the, the last um, seminar of, um, virtual seminar rather, of uh, New Voices in Global Security. My name is Amanda Chisholm and I am the chair and organizer of this series. The series itself, for those of you who aren't familiar, aims to showcase the vibrant and diverse research of our uh, PhD and early career researchers across the School of Security Studies. And we've been um, having this series for the past two years um, and really excited again to, uh, for our last one of this term, to have a uh, Aou uh, Kuchasafahani, sorry Aou, I probably totally messed up your last name. Um, uh, we're so excited to have you here speaking about presenting your emerging research entitled Traces in Afterlives, Iranian Women's Digital Activism as Narration of Their Struggle. So Aou is a PhD candidate at the Department of War Studies here at King's College, and her research is concerned with feminist politics and social movements with a focus on Iran. Her thesis traces the trajectory of feminist activism um, in Iran in the 20th century to today, uh, with an emphasis on the role of social media in shaping modern feminist discourse. And she's previously held roles in digital communication in the public sector and in the third sector. We're so pleased to have you present today. Um, so Aou is joined by Dr. Omar Al-Ghazi and he is going to act as um, her discussant. Uh, well, what I've asked Aou to speak for about 20 to 25 minutes, and in which case after that, we'll have um, um, Dr. Al-Ghazi come and provide some um, commentary before we open it up the floor to you, the audience, for further questions. Uh, we've asked at this point, if you have any questions, to please just put them in the question answer box so Aou can read them and I can um, read them out loud to her as well. Uh, well, without further ado, I'll hand the virtual floor over to you. You have some slides you want to share, is that right? Thank you, Amanda. Um, and yes, I will just share my screen. Uh, one second. Is it working? Yeah, you still have it in, you don't have it in a presenter view just yet, though. Yeah. Um, I will have that right away. <laughs> I'm so sorry about this. That's I okay, take your time. It's this one, yes? Yes. Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Um, so um, thank you for the really nice introduction, Amanda. Um, and I'm really glad to be here today um, discussing uh, one of the chapters of my um, thesis, which um, yeah is about women's rights activism in Iran. I'm specifically looking at social media and how it is changing um, the landscape of the narrative on women's rights activism. So, um, mm, sorry. Um, oh gosh. Sorry about that. So um, my framework in, in this chapter is basically a, a post-structuralist um, framework. I situate my research in post-structuralism's relational conception of identity, um, whereby an identity is given through reference to something it is not. 
Um, it is precisely the contestation by competing narratives um, and competing actors under the same main identity um, that has historically caused friction. And what I mean by that is um, the question of who is Iranian and what, I mean, who uh, is an Iranian woman more specifically has always been contested. Um, how do I mean this? The most uh, stark uh, um, contrast is the Islamic versus secular um, discourse on women, um, which is a point of contention uh, ever since the revolution of 1979. And um, ever since then, the state narrative has focused on maintaining this us versus them approach. So I'm interested, interested to find out why um, is this to exert influence and power? Um, and then to inform my understanding of how power is maintained on social media, I use critical discourse analysis as I'm interested to know what power language holds specifically within technological advances like online media. Um, so I will use um, critical discourse analysis, I mean CDA from now on. So CDA focuses on integrating the online within the linguistic discourse research field. The online is an important environment that in discursive technology has its own native discourse, um, which is referred to as online native discourse. Um, the online native discourse represents any discourse created within a digital ecosystem. Um, so I use this um, mm, uh, method to help navigate the premise upon which networks and power structures operate online, the machinations of social media, so to speak. It will provide answers as to why certain actors have wider reach and, more and are more visible on social media platforms. Um, so there is an argument. Uh, I was sorry, sorry to interrupt, but maybe you're you're shuffling papers uh, next to the laptop because I can hear uh, like it's difficult to hear you because there's a lot of noise. So if you can please be be careful with that. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. Yes. Um, okay. Um, I'll be more mindful. <laughs> sorry. Um, so um, Pavo uh, Marie Pavo who whose research focuses on um, discourse analysis online, argues that to analyze native online discourse, we need to rethink the dualism of language and world by moving beyond this um, uh, dual dualism and into a post-dualist approach in which linguistic material flows in continuum with the environment in which it is situated in and not separately from it. Um, this post-dualist viewpoint, um, uh, she argues, views the realm of the internet as a techno-linguistic ecosystem. So this framing allows me to analyze a series of techno-linguistic words as they relate to the online environment such as hashtags, um, retweets, likes, and shares. Within the literature on Iranian feminism, little research has been done on the role of social media and such an analysis fills that gap. Um, so I'm not only interested in finding out why women's rights activists use social media, but I'm also interested to find out how um, social media platforms affect the discourse by virtue of their um, functions. Um, I need to shuffle the page, sorry. That's okay. Um, so, uh, so an analysis of how they are used to form online discourse and how they yield the power to attract audiences online. 
Now for my methodology. Um, uh, I use a methodology of reading, which is uh, a post-structuralist methodology, um, which is um, allows for the observation and analysis of the different representations of the identities and their discourses. Therefore, I place my research within this feminist post-structuralist lens as it bases itself on the premise that identities are constructed and therefore how they are constructed and how they continue to shape discourse on Iranian women's rights are key concerns. Next, I use interviews with women identifying activists, journalists, and lawyers within the um, diaspora to gather qualitative data on their use of social media and their experiences of online sexual harassment um, as women with large platforms. And the other thing I'm doing is I'm monitoring uh, social media platforms, specifically Twitter, and analyzing hashtags through tracing the trajectory of hashtags um, in the women's rights activism movement online, which um, has predominantly started from 2014, and I will explain why um, shortly. So, sorry about that. Contextualizing the internet in Iran. Um, sorry. The internet was introduced to Iran in 1993. Um, in 2019, the Internet World Stats reported that over 70% of Iran's population, so more than 62 million people, um, are internet users in a country with a population of 82 million. That's a very significant amount, obviously. So over 60% of Iran's 82 million people are also under 30 years old, um, which is a striking, um, yeah. Um, so early online dissent activities um, started uh, in the 90s, in the late 90s with um, the reformists, uh, and the conservatives, these different political factions inside Iran. Um, and they started using um, magazines um, and uh, with the beginning, with the early onset of the internet, blogs also became a very um, important tool for uh, building on the discourse. Um, and then, so with the onset of blogs, online journalism grew exponentially um, in response to the backlash against um, uh, print publications being shut down by um, the state. And so recently there's been a rise in the use of social media um, websites, um, predominantly Instagram, uh, because Instagram is yet to be blocked by Iran. Um, and Twitter is used predominantly by journalists and is um, also important um, for the transnational Iranian public sphere. Um, and um, 40 million users are currently using Instagram, Twitter, and messaging app uh, Telegram. Mm, so, uh, what is the Iranian transnational public sphere? Um, to go back to Habermas, um, the public sphere insinuates that there is a private sphere um, as well. And um, Habermas um, conceptualized public sphere as a bourgeois idea of a sphere that relies on the emergence of a mode of, of critical public discourse um, representative of the public's interests within civil society and, more importantly, against the state. Um, Berlant uh, takes this point further, arguing that Habermas's definition of the public sphere depended on the expansion of 
class mixed semi formal institutions like salons and cafes um, and uh, print media oh sorry print media and um, uh, organizations uh, I need to change the page so I might just mute myself for a second or if someone can mute me while I do that I'm very sorry about this Oh. oh, no, not okay yet. Sorry about this. So um, the private uh, sphere, until then relegated to the collective intimacy, um, uh, has now made it to a public sphere, um, arguably a democratic public sphere, that has turned collective intimacy to a public and social ideal without which the public's role as political um, critic could not be established. That was a quote from Berlin. But I argue that the public sphere carries on into the online in conjunction with the private sphere, um, the collective intimacy, so to speak. So thinking of how cafes and salons are places where people convene in small groups to discuss ideas and share um, experiences. Um, I argue that these are replicated online when people meet under the auspices of collective identities, modes of organizing that make it easy to find like-minded people with um, similar interests. And techno discursive terms such as the hashtag, uh, the like button, the retweet options um, are also um, mm, uh, substantive elements. Therefore, in the same way that the online is a new realm upon which the public sphere has expanded, so too does the online actually rely on the intimate, the private sphere, because um, of the affordances uh, collective identities provide online. I define the Iranian transnational public sphere as an amalgamation of the public and private, a broad umbrella term encompassing all the different collective identities or intimate publics therein. Um, so, uh, in other words, um, social media platforms as tools that convey messages um, is, I mean, is not enough to uh, look at them as tools that convey messages. The, there needs, to, there is a neglect um, of uh, the analysis of the content conveyed through the tools of social media. Um, so that is what I'm trying to uh, do uh, using uh, an analysis of discourses and iconographies forged by activists on social media. Um, so it's also important for me to look more closely at what constitutes collective belonging and what the affect of it is. Because affects of belonging are the relation between the attachment to the world and the feeling of belonging to the world. First, I believe that what is at stake here is the question of identity and how it is constructed online. In the process of forming to be part of the social, we lose control because we want to know people we do not know and create a world that we do not know yet. This explains why attachment is political, as Berlin notes. 
Um, Berlin's point on the political being a place of excitement, so belonging, and politics being a place where people are disappointed, um, hence underpins my assumption of a mutual existence of spheres of mobilization and contestation that run in parallel to each other. This assumption rests also on the evidence that social media is a space of contestation in addition to its enabling of connections to be made and collective identities that it births in common struggle, opposition and celebration of a topic. So who constitute the Iranian, oops, who constitute the Iranian public sphere? So um, very broadly, I identify four uh, um, broad categories of uh, collective identities. So the first one is um, Persian speakers uh, predominantly residing in Iran. Um, and I'm going to have to switch the pages again on my notes. So, um, by focusing on the different collective identities that form the Iranian transnational public sphere, I ask how, if at all, can they be interrelated? Collective actors are important figures shaping collective identities. There are four main strands that um, uh, I have identified. Uh, through my data collection alongside my interview participants' responses. So yes, the first is the collective identity of Iranians inside the country who write predominantly in Persian and who use social media in order to highlight what is going on. This is of course, as I said, a broad generalization, but it serves as a way to underpin the fact that while access to the internet is not completely free uh, inside Iran, that users of social media from within Iran post content for a range of reasons, from economic to social to political uh, reasons. But for the remit of this research, I focus on the political and the context in which the political is posted online. So political organizing um, in Iran in a physical capacity um, is extremely dangerous as um, I can, as, as the example of the 1 million signatures campaign uh, proves. Um, uh, the 1 million signatures campaign um, was a collective uh, movement of um, Iranian um, activists um, and lawyers um, uh, gathering signatures from all across Iran, um, from shops to cafes, to schools, to government agencies, to um, uh, pro protect women's rights and block the detrimental family protection law from passing in 2008 under then President Ahmadinejad. While that movement was successful in blocking um, this uh, law from passing, um, all of its members were imprisoned um, and um, many have fled as a result. Yes, so stifling online discourse, um, I mean, through national censorship and the creation of um, bots uh, that aim to attack dissident voices online are some of the means the state resorts to to make the online space hostile. Collective actors are contesting um, each other um, while collective identities keep to themselves. I'm sorry, I realize I skipped a bit here. So uh, this goes to my 
to the second category, the state and non-state actors. So because of uh, the fact that um, organizing physically um, is dangerous inside Iran, the online is constitutes a new space uh, with potential. And that's why st the state um, tries to um, create as much of a hostile environment online as it possibly can by creating these bots and by um, trying to distort um, any sign of unity. Yes, so then the um, non-state actors discuss uh, as part of the I'm not saying they are the same. I'm saying how there are some connections uh, between some influential Iranian figures and some non-state actors who um, conspire together at times. So um, the influential Iranian figures are um, those who have large platforms and who are predominantly re resident in the diaspora and who by virtue of having large platforms um, are connected to the transnational public sphere um, through their engagement with diasporic um, media sources from conventional media to the online media. What do I mean by conventional media in the diaspora? I mean the television channels um, that have been created um, uh, in this a year spanning 2005 uh, to 2011, uh, which are very strong um, in um, upholding a um, space for the transnational Iranian public sphere to connect. These um, figures have um, regular, uh, are regularly uh, engaging with these um, television channels, um, and some even have their own shows. So, sorry, I'm gonna have to move the page again. So the diasporic Iranians were able to identify with Iranians inside the country um, through their mutual viewing of these channels. Uh, I will name them. So Manoto, um, Iran International, BBC Persian, and Voice of America Persian. These are really instrumental in creating these connections between Iranians inside the country and outside. Um, these channels air from London uh, and New York and Washington and um, show both entertainment and news programs in Persian and about Iran. These, uh, there is an important link between these channels and the diasporic activists who, as I said, are given airtime on them. Um, for instance, the first tweeter um, in the Iranian Me Too movement um, residing in the diaspora um, who revealed she was abused by a prominent artist had an exclusive telephone interview on Iran International um, who in picking up her story helped to amplify her story and crucially to put pressure on the perpetrator. Um, I will discuss the Iran Iranian Me Too movement uh, later. Mm. Um, so just to end on this note, uh, why do I use the word strand? Uh, I think that is four different, uh, I suppose, categories. It's, I purposefully use the term strand because um, I, I, I aim to show that these strands can overlap and they are not entirely independent from each other. Um, the 
even though the Iranian transnational public sphere can be ripe with division, contestation, and co-optation, at the same time, there are some moments where some of these strands connect. Um, yeah. And um, especially evident in the connection, as I said, between exiled journalists um, and the conventional media, but also um, exiled journalists with Iranian women uh, inside the country, all of them from different political spheres, uh, um, denouncing, for instance, the sexual harassment and rape, as was the case at the early onset of the Me Too movement. So I'm also interested to find out why these moments of connection are fleeting. Um, so I will try to... Which hashtags and why? <laughs> Which hashtags am I looking at and why are hashtags in, in particular? So to go back to um, techno-discursive um, terminology, um, hashtags in strict techno-discursive terms develop another meaning outside of their linguistic one. So they become hypertext, uh, linking different texts written at different times. This form of transmission is unique to the online environment and thus, I argue, it can be effectively considered as a form of digital archiving of texts, images, and videos across social media platforms. Um, so the hashtags I'm looking at are My Stealthy Freedom, um, because it is the first of a set of major hashtags that were specifically made to challenge the discriminatory law against women's compulsory hijab, um, which started a thread of other hashtags, um, notably the White Wednesdays and the My Camera is My Weapon. After that, um, because I follow a chronological order, I have to say as well, I start with these three hashtags and then I move on to the girls of Enkelob Street. The Girls of Enkelop Street is um, a grassroots movement that started in Iran, also protesting against the um, compulsory hijab, which um, arguably took influence from the My Stealthy Freedom campaign. And then finally, I look at the uh, emerging, uh, the fairly recent um, hashtag of Me Too Iran and in Farsi, in Persian, it's called Manham, which literally translates to me too. So um, these are just some examples of the hashtags, uh, of the content behind these hashtags. Um, so why do I start by looking at the um, My Stealthy Freedom? It is because I look at hashtags that emerged in the women's rights discourse in the years following the Green Movement uprising in uh, 2009. Um, they were created, uh, these hashtags were created by Masi Ali Najad, a uh, former parliamentary journalist inside Iran. She first created the hashtag My Stealthy Freedom. Um, as a critique of the compulsory hijab once she was in um, exile after the uprising. Her activism has then evolved from that hashtag. Um, and um, so she is a she is um, a controversial figure who I will get to um, later on as well. Um, so just to stick with um, the theme of hashtags, why hashtags for now? Um, in a critical discourse analysis, uh, a strong belief exists that we cannot simply extract the text from its online environment. It must be placed within its techno discursive context. So the creation of the My Stealthy Freedom campaign was the first use of a hashtag to gather supporters 
um, and advocates of the Iranian um, women's rights movement under one place. And crucially, what started out as a collection of images to showcase women's stealthy freedom online, turned into a campaign mobilized by and mobilizing people through their anger. And these examples show that, I hope at least, um, but the anger is felt uh, through the content being shared behind these hashtags. Um, and also as uh, picked up in the interviews, um, my interviewees responded unanimously that social media is a platform for anger. So anger, toxicity, and slandering are the words that almost all of the interviewees used to describe the online environment. And um, they agreed these were serious issues in the context of Iranian women's rights online in particular. So it took some years for the My Stealthy Freedom campaign to take off uh, the ground. As evidenced um, above, it was only after the discourse on online became more um, one-sided. What do I mean by that? Um, with the evolution of her hashtag, My Stealthy Freedom, um, um, Ali Nejad um, grew ever more um, hostile to um, uh, the supposition that um, women have a right to choose what to wear. She started off um, by uh, campaigning for women uh, to have the right to choose if they want to wear the hijab or not. And gradually, um, it has shifted to a rather more of an Islamophobic um, discourse, um, uh, saying that the, uh, the compulsory hijab is a um, reason for uh, the Islamic Republic having to um, go all in all, I mean, uh, once and for all. I mean, the point here is that she is equating women's compulsory hijab to all of the uh, repressions that the state um, uh, forces on, on women in Iran. So, How did the My Stealthy Freedom campaign take off? Um, Ali Najad um, receives images and photos from women inside Iran, as you can see on these images. They are sent to her and she posts them on her large platforms. Um, so one of my interviewees, and um, who wish to remain anonymous, um, told me that she receives regular direct messages on Twitter and Instagram from women inside Iran, asking her for immigration advice as she is a lawyer. Um, and she says that the, the movement on social media, the movement of my stealthy freedom, um, some of them, you know, some of these women have literally taken to the streets um, to um, remove their hijab as an act of defiance. And others have challenged the system in other ways, but a lot of them tell uh, her that they were inspired through seeing things on social media. And so in that sense, um, this, it's a very recent development over maybe the past you know, five years. And so taking to the streets to um, remove your hijab is a very dangerous act. That is why they um, subsequently um, are forced to flee Iran um, because they face imprisonment. So 
Ali Najad also receives a lot of uh, trolling and harassment directed at her, but so do other Iranian women who possess a large platform online. Um, and some have argued that there are still larger positives that outweigh the online abuse endured. Um, as one interviewee, um, who also wishes to remain anonymous, um, points out, um, it has inspired many ordinary Iranian women who come from quote unquote less moneyed and uh, less educated backgrounds to come out and demand change. Um, so the, the argument here is that the power that social media gives to these ordinary women um, is the power of having their demands visibilized once the rejection of the compulsory hijab um, um, you know, through that symbol. So how do I mean they're visibilized? Once through the potential of having their images shared with a wider audience, but also through the rejection of the compulsory hijab. The rejection of the Islamic Republic. Um, so I fear I have to go faster. So, as I said, Ali Najad is a controversial figure because of um, her um, narrow focus on uh, creating a space of anger and um, toxicity online um, in the sense that she, um, it's hard to see, and this is, these are images of, the, on the left you have a screenshot of just half a day on her Instagram and on the right, just half a day on her Twitter. Um, she repeatedly um, posts the same video throughout the day. And um, um, the, the main point of contention with her is that um, she is reaching out to uh, people inside Iran to mobilize them um, to put their lives at more um, risk, basically. Moving on to the girls of Envelop Street. Um, this movement, which, as I said, is a grassroots movement that started in Iran, as you can see on the left um, image, um, the first woman to um, take up this um, protest with putting her um, veil on a stick and holding it out. Her name was Vida Movahedi. Um, so um, yes, this native movement was partly inspired by Ali Najat's campaign, but also came as a result of many other socioeconomic factors faced by Iranians who took to the streets in protest in November 2017, um, in what became the first upheaval that was blocked from social media, as it marked the first time the state shut down the internet to block people from sharing and following live coverage of the protests. So the image of this woman um, holding her white headscarf while standing on a plinth in the midst of the crowd um, made it onto social media and was quickly filed under the hashtag um, girl, girls of envelope street. Um, it sparked a movement of other Iranian women emulating Vida Mubahidi, who you can see on the image, um, from uh, this form of silent protest. Um, so in my interview with one of the girls of Envelope Street, who also wishes to remain anonymous, she describes the moment she saw Vida Mubahidi, the first woman to take up the silent stand. Um, and she quotes this image as being a powerful moment as if her silence was the scream of all of us. She says that the act of standing on that tent and holding the compulsory hijab in her hands was a cry for justice, for acknowledgement from the state that women have agency too. Um, so Rida Mubahidi 
The top tweets with her name as a hashtag are of her sentencing, uh, short release and re-imprisonment. And the last tweet was dated 2019. She has had no digital presence of her own. Her image, the only trace of her circulating the online environment and being shared by women's rights activists in the diaspora, by um, Western supporters and some policymakers alike. Um, uh, so once uh, policymakers and Western supporters uh, uh, chime in, the stories get sensationalized or um, not always, but have a tendency to get sensationalized and they receive a lot more attention outside of the Iranian transnational sphere. Um, so there's an interesting link uh, between um, policymakers within more conservative right-wing leaning um, US think tanks that advocate for war with Iran um, and uh, then tweet, I mean, pushing Iranian women's rights activism uh, to fit within their discourse of lobbying for more sanctions and war on Iran, which is detrimental to Iranian women. So it's very ironic. Um, with my interview participants, when I asked them whether social media makes women's rights activism harder, there is no straight answer but a call to debate the pros and cons of using social media, um, as one respondent uh, says, um, is required. Um, she also believes that one of the main challenges is the pressure on civil society inside Iran and the non-recognition of the right for women to organize. Another interviewee believes that social media can certainly help as it is through this space that we become aware of stories. So in that sense, I, quite, I, I wonder, I, I ask, can it be said that social media by virtue of its technological format is shaping feminist discourse in Iran by allowing some forms of activism to um, take precedence over others? So, and final um, hashtag in my research is the Me Too Iran or the Manham. Um, so, <clears throat> in August 2020, there was a seismic shift in women's rights activism with the coming forward of many women to talk about their stories of sexual harassment in Iran. The whirlwind hashtag campaign of Me Too had reached Iran as women university students, journalists, and employees um, revealed their stories of sexual abuse at the hands of powerful Iranian men, many of them well-established figures within their fields, um, with a near, I would say, um, untouchable status as a result of their high-reaching connections. The campaign started when a female university student in Iran broke her silence on Twitter, calling out Kayvan Emami, a bookshop owner in the university's vicinity, for luring her back to his apartment and drugging and raping her. Soon after, other women students came forward because the exact same thing had happened to them. Thus, a chain of narratives on sexual assault and rape started emerging out of the bravery of one single person's tweet. Um, so the Me Too Iran hashtag um, campaign managed to open the lid on the toxic environment under which many women have suffered and had not dared to confront um, out of fear of the shame and um, victim blaming that could ensue from the public as well as a larger fear, fear of suffering repercussions for having extramarital sex in a country that criminalizes this very act. This was a first for speaking out in public on matters relating to sexual violence in Iran and among Iranians. I mean, aside from, or perhaps arguably um, in addition to 
the Islamic Republic's punitive stance on sexual relations outside of marriage, it is important to also note that speaking um, publicly about rape and sexual assault is culturally also unheard of in Iran. Therefore, it is not an overstatement to suggest that this movement has catapulted feminist discourse into educating, debating, and narrating on sexual violence. With the first allegation against this uh, bookshop owner, um, others came forward online too, making the case for his arrest clear. By the end of 2020, um, police had announced that they had arrested him in what was a sign that they were compelled to act accordingly, faced by the pressure of both the increasing um, uh, um, allegations against Imani by former and current female students, as well as the growing support um, and mo uh, mobilization online um, for the victims who had spoken up about their ordeal. The discourse had grown ever stronger with multiple voices coming out in support of the victims, which was an unprecedented moment. Um, his imprisonment thus came as a very welcome sign of the government taking sexual violence seriously while feeling pressured by the transnational Iranian public sphere. Then in the diaspora, this campaign continued when later in August, 2020, Sara Omatali, um, a former journalist turned educator, broke her silence by releasing a series of tweets um, referred to obviously in, on Twitter as a thread, um, recounting her ordeal at the hands of a prominent Iranian artist, uh, namely Aydin Avdoshlu. While, while she did not use the hashtags MeTooIran or Manham initially, her tweets um, sparked this movement um, in the diaspora as well. The movement forced the taboo of sexual relations um, to be brought to the fore in this conservative society. And as a result, police temporarily suspended its law of citing extramarital sexual relations as a crime so that women could be encouraged to come forward and testify against their abusers. <laughs> This is the first time a social media campaign was able to change policy in the conservative religious country, even if it was only short-lived. It heralded a societal shift in speaking about sexual harassment more openly, and that marks a turning point. My concluding remarks, in conclusion, um, I, um, what I tried to show in this um, presentation today is that online media remains a contested space where different collective actors within the Iranian transnational public sphere construct realities, conspire against one another and co-opt narratives. Um, further from this, and if uh, there's time to discuss this maybe in the Q&A. Um, I would also like to point out how, um, as a result of wanting to maintain a hold on um, what gets out of the country, the Iranian government has proposed a drastic internet nationalization bill to further curb and restrict citizens' access to the internet. Meanwhile, there are regular internet shutdowns targeting local areas in protest um, to make it difficult for news of the uprisings to reach the outside in real time, as is happening today as we speak in Khuzestan. Um, so with this, I just want to conclude saying how the internet and the online uh, space is a 
crucial um, uh, contested space where different forces um, battle to um, have uh, the, the larger voice, the, the louder voice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ayu, for such a fascinating um, discussion. I love where your PhD is going, and I particularly love the empirical richness um, of, of your work here. Um, so unfortunately, we actually don't have any time for questions. We're totally out of time. I didn't know if you had planned to speak for so long, and I didn't want to interrupt you because you were... I mean, I, I was engrossed and I'm sure Omar was engrossed in conversation as well. Um, but this is something I think we definitely need to continue this conversation as, as your um, chapters progress. I don't know, I might just um, give one minute to Omar if he has any um, uh, comments that you wanna make before we have to wrap up. Um, yeah, sure, um, I'll, I'll be quick uh, given the time constraints. First, Ahul, um, I also wanted to congratulate you on on your work and the way that it is uh, developing. It's very fascinating um, indeed. And actually like what my, the gist of what I want to say is that it is, your, your work is, is much more interesting and fascinating than you are presenting it in a way, which is, which is where I want to push you because you, you begin and conclude with the idea that um, the internet is a place of contestation, site of political struggle, but, but what you're presenting um, is so much richer than that, because we, we, are, we know that the internet is such a space in various contexts around the world. The challenge for you is to kind of think more specifically about um, Iranian um, digital culture, uh, particularly as it relates to, to activism, which, you know, which in the empirical part you're already doing, but you can present it in a, and, and you know, kind of uh, speak back to theory in, in a much more enriching way. Because if you think, as you explained in relation to the, like when you talked about who the Iranian online public sphere is, it's a very unique public sphere, right? Because, because of the role of the diaspora, because of the interaction between the digital and like uh, mainstream sources, and because of the geopolitical situation that makes any discussion on Iran kind of leak into the, the geopolitical and the imperial and, and so forth that makes uh, feminist activism perhaps particularly challenging and its analysis. So what I would what I would suggest is kind of you try to avoid like talking about social media or the internet kind of in broad in broad terms especially that actually your case studies are also in, in terms of like the historic uh, um, context, you're, you're looking at case studies from different times and, and social media themselves have, have changed um, in that time and kind of anchored more concretely in the interviews that, that you're, you're doing. Um, and perhaps like the, the idea of the hashtag is, is more important than like how the question is, the question of how do, um, the, your interviewees, you know, how do these activists um, conceive of the hashtag as an activist tool um, in relation to, to, feminist, um, to feminist activism? Like you talked about visibility, you talked about perhaps the connection between um, across time and across like these different sectors within Iran, outside Iran. You talked about emotion um, and how like they, they uh, associate it with, with anger. So perhaps there's space for, for a typology that you can bring forth in relation to how activists deal with the, with the hashtag. Um, also, you know, like the, the visuals that, that are attached to this hashtag, like there, it's a very particular also visual culture, like the, the pictures that, that I've seen with the, with the women, you know, like taking up space, extending their arms, the embodiment. Um, yeah, like, so, so that is, I think, where, like, the kind of the, the really the value and the richness of, of what you're working on kind of comes across. So I would, I would kind of um, stay away from, from thinking in broad terms about the internet and social media and, and to theory, like, you know, 
uh, all these Western um, theorists, whether they're whether they're talking about social media or about the public sphere, like they didn't have Iran, you know, in mind when they were theorizing. So why why should you uh, or us like spend time kind of thinking about how they apply or or not? Just you know speak speak back like yes, okay, you know. Habermas and Berlin, but but the richness of what you're doing, the contribution of of you know what what you're offering, is actually much richer. So I would start with like with, with an ethnographic sensibility in which you're doing, but you know bring it out more as you as you um, as you go along. Um, I'll I'll email you with with some suggestions as well for uh, kind of uh, you know books that that might be. Uh, helpful for for your project but um, but yeah thank you for sharing your research with us thank you so much yes thank you very much thank you thank you Alu. so i just want to give the final floor to you Alu, if you want to say anything before unfortunately we have to end the discussion because there's another one coming up right away so we might be kicked off but um do you have any final um I'm comments sorry, or I, i'm very sorry that i went so much over time i Time okay. before, but I think it was because I had to um, take time to change the pages. I, I apologize for that. Um, so yes, no, thank you so much for your comments, Omar. And I think um, absolutely you're right. I need to focus more on, um, uh, I suppose, I don't like to use the word extracting, but to, to figure out, um, as you say, why Iranian, um, women's rights activists and journalists, et cetera, are using um, social media, how they are using it more, more specifically. Um, in terms of theorizing, I think, um, as I say also uh, in the beginning, as I said, there is very little theorization within the Iranian context. So I'm trying to find, I'm, I guess what I'm trying to do is find uh, a, a theory that I can anchor my research in, um, but I definitely do take your point um, that I need to focus more on the actual research as in like why um, Iranian women's activists are uh, using social media. And I hope to be able to expand that. And this chapter that I um, presented is uh, part of another, I mean, it, there are two big chapters within my thesis um, separated into two. So I suppose what I need to do is then um, edit it better to really be able to place everything uh, together. <laughs> but no, thank you so much. Thank you, Amanda, as well, for giving me the time to speak. Um, and uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to email me. I'm very sorry. There was no time for Q&A. Don't worry about it. Don't apologize. I think just to quickly echo Omar's point too is, you know, um, as anyone who does research on communities that Western theorists did not have in mind when they were, when they, you know, they were building these concepts or whatnot, I think it's, um, I think um, Omar is right in thinking um, foreground your empirics, right? Um, in a way that how does that experience help you think about these concepts instead of foregrounding the concepts themselves. And you might then adopt, you know, what some feminists like um, uh, Christina Sylvester, for example, talks about the collage making, where when she's trying to make sense of empirics, she um, grabs concepts from here and there to help, but it's all about um, prioritizing your field work first, right? And how that helps you make, make, make sense of what's going on. So it might not just be Halberstam or it might not be Berlant itself, but it might be a few different concepts. Um, but yeah, that ethnographic sensibility that, um, you know, I think uh, that's key. And I, I felt like in your presentation, that's where you came to your fore and that's where things got really interesting is when you were exploring the richness uh, of this community and what, you know, what does that tell us about um, social organizing, or po po polit uh, political mobility, about activism, about social networks. So those are my two cents. I'm abusing my position of chair to, to say that too. Um, yes, don't be afraid to, um, you know, to, to um, um, prioritize your empirical research. You have such an important thing to say, or lots of things to say, theory, empirical, otherwise. So 
um, yeah, so good luck. And I can't wait to see how your research progresses. Can't wait to see this in print. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Omar, so much for your really thoughtful comments um, and, and for being a part of the series. And thank you Alu, for, for your presentation and to you, the audience, for, for coming and listening in. So um, I'm sure uh, if you have any comments or questions, like I said, you can you can pop her an email or follow her on social media. Everyone have a great afternoon. Thanks for so much. Thanks so much for tuning in. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.